This is the Opimahau Creek and the Opimahau Creek Valley. And this valley has been home to people for over 6,000 years. We had to save this property. We had to save these archaeological resources. So the idea was we're going to build a park. We're going to build this heritage park, which became Wanuskewin. We find a lot of different sites and a lot of sites throughout the valley, and they tell us of a really, really well put together story of people living here. So this is a place people could live and hunt, but we also have a medicine wheel. And there's right around 200 of them that we know about on the plains. So there's very, very few compared to hundreds of thousands of TV rings. So for us to have one here is really, really special. It's also the one the furthest north on the plains. So you won't find any others further north. From my perspective, I'd say ours is probably to commemorate the place and to acknowledge the significance that the Opimaha Valley has had to people for so, so long. Lots and lots of different people have come here from all over, so the same people that might have been down in Montana or North Dakota, Southern Alberta, they were here at some point. It was a place you could come and you knew you'd find other people to trade with and to hunt with, and so really, really special that way. Once we're down there, you'll notice there's very little wind. As people, we really like that, but animals also like that. What are some animals that live here now? I'd say the most common ones we have are bunnies, uh, coyotes, and deer. There's beavers that live through the creek. We see them making dams. I don't see them very often, but I see them and the dams they've made. So now I think we can keep going. We'll walk down into the valley and stop at the, the thundercloud site, and you'll notice that we're a lot more sheltered from the wind down there. So yeah, let's head out this way. What kind of berries are these? These ones are rose hips. Yeah. We'll see some rose more. Hips? Yeah, rose hips. Green, what about the green one? Uh, snowberries. Here we are at the Thundercloud archaeology site, and we excavated here in the 1990s. We're pretty close to the bison jump, so this made for a good spot to live if you were hunting. One of the really cool things we found at Thundercloud was some pottery. It was as if like a piece of pottery had broken and fragments from it people carved into these little discs that were, they're perfectly circular, really, really smooth and shiny. They're really, really nicely made out of clay. And Dr. Walker, he identified them as gaming pieces. And so this told us that people here were playing some sort of game, doing something for entertainment about three, 400 years ago, which is before contact with Europeans. And that on its own is really, really important. We're gonna continue on over there and head to another site now. Alrighty, let's go to the TV village. Let's do it. Now, the interesting thing about the teepee has only been used in the last 2,000 years. And we've seen people living here in the valley for over 6,000 years. So I have a teepee set up behind me. This one is an 18-foot Plains Cree style teepee. 18 feet is really massive, um, so it'd be a lot smaller back in the day. And when horses came to the area about 500 years ago, they got bigger. And now that we have trucks and flatbeds, they're huge. But before, um, Plains Cree teepee were a woman's teaching, which means that usually a woman would be the one to put it up and take it down and move it across the landscape, which is a lot of work. Nowadays, here at the park, we do teepee teachings for everyone because each pole has a teaching or lesson. So the first three are respect, obedience, and humility. And that forms the tripod. And that's the forms the tripod in ourselves. So if we don't have respect for others or ourselves then our teepee would be leaning. Same thing about humility and obedience. I'm gonna give you guys a couple minutes to explore. It's pretty cool. Well, can you imagine with a fire in here what it would be like? It'd be pretty cozy. As we set up the Plains Creek teepee, there's a couple different protocols that we have to follow. The first one, of course, is the teepee actually takes form of a woman at the end, and I'll show you how it, that looks. But that's why we as women are wearing our skirts. And we have to honor ourselves as powerful women, as life givers, and as holders of so much knowledge. So that's why we wear the skirts as we set up this. The bottom can go down there, and then tuck the top underneath. Even underneath this guy. Perfect. So hold it there, and then when you're ready, you can walk one full circle, okay? And it's tempting, but we still have to make all of our circles. And the reason why we're making a complete circle is because each pole, we're getting smarter, we're getting older, we're making more rounds. So there's symbolism in everything. 
So the door needs to come up right here. So go ahead and just pull it in. There we go. This teepee has so much meaning in terms of spirituality, stories, but also if you imagine this is actually a woman. The bottom part is a skirt and the flaps are her arms. So she's actually out holding her arms open and ready to welcome anyone. When I think of ultimate protection, I think of my mom hugging me. And of course, this is actually their home, what they would live in, so it would protect them from the winds, from the outdoors, from everything else. It's also control flaps. So these can actually close and cover up this giant hole here, which means you can trap in the heat, you can um, open them back up if you have a fire inside and let out the smoke. But also the top part here, since we built it in the clockwise direction, we built essentially an eagle's nest. So this represents the nest of the highest flying bird. We honor that bird so much because we believe that since he flies so high, he can carry our thoughts, our prayers, our dreams, whatever messages we want to send up to whoever's up there, he can carry it for us. So he has a place in our home. And then of course our door is facing the east because that's where the sun comes up. And we always want to make sure we start our, our days thinking, being thankful. If you had a bad day yesterday, there's always tomorrow that it could be better. Thank you. Uh, well, first off, welcome to Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis. This dance originates from our relatives to the west here in southern Alberta and northern Montana, what we refer to commonly as the men's prairie chicken dance. And so this dance here uh, mimics the male prairie chickens in the early springtime. And so the male prairie chickens, they'll strut around, they'll dance, they'll maneuver, anything to capture the attention of the audience. And so my dance incorporates that and mimics some of the movements and we, we move, we dance to the rhythm of the drum. So what is the symbolism behind what you're wearing? These pieces that I wear are made of different components and every one of them have a significant story. And so my regalia here is a representation of symbolisms that are protection symbolisms in my society, in my, in my nation. Every component of my regalia was either made by myself, my immediate family, uh, specifically my wife and my daughters, and they all had a hand in this, but also their relatives. And so I don't look this good just by myself. It's my, my, my uh, family, my immediate family, that makes me look this good. Today, we're having a nice learning experience. Would you guys like to participate? Sure. Learn a little bit of dancing? Come on up. Welcome. You know, as First Nations people, we are a very uh, inviting neighboring community. We always accept many people from all walks of life to participate with us only because we want them to experience and understand where we are coming from so that you may find significance in your own history, in your own story also. Here we go. Let's go. Ruffle your feet. Roll your shoulders. Open and close your wings. Okay, let's get low. Let's add a hop. <laughs> well, that sound is replicated in the drumming too. You know, it makes us feel comfortable, makes us confident, makes us proud. And so that's what that drum represents for us. That's the sound, that's the heartbeat of our nation. So thank you for joining us here today. I hope you enjoy the rest of the part and I hope you learned uh, some significance of our dancing. Well, thank you both for sharing your dance and your, your song. Hanging out in the valley, you may notice that there's a lot of things that make Wanuskewin special. Um, but also what makes Wanuskewin unique is, of course, it's an ecological island. And when you think of an island, you think of a small piece of land in the middle of an ocean. But that's exactly what Wanuskewin is. If you can look around you, um, I can see an abundance of medicinal plants. And if you look over there, you may see something in the distance. Can you spot it? Wow. Do you know what it is? 
That is a wonderful bird. Of course, as Katie mentioned, we have 140 different bird species that call this place home. I and mean, that one was a blue heron. And I think the last time we saw one was two years ago, oh, yeah. uh, which was pretty special. So when the elders talk about the specialty of this place, as archeologists, of course, we're pretty biased on the beautiful archeological record that's here, but it's also like a magnet pulling people in. So I just wanna stop here real quick to point out one of my favorite plants. These beautiful berries are something called haw berries, but specifically they're on the hawthorn plant. This is a very huge spike. And honestly, they're pretty deadly, um, but the people knew that they could use these spikes as fishing hooks, as awls, as sewing needles, because a small bird actually picks up prey like mice, flies above the bush and drops it and the mouse gets impaled on these spikes. So they knew it was strong. So it's pretty crazy. And that's why it's my favorite. <laughs> We've been doing archeology span here for 40 years. This is the longest continuously running archeological research project in Canadian history. This is all about heart. This is all about bringing First Nations and non-First Nations together. It's incredibly uh, important that we do this. And this community stood up and said, this is what we need to do.